Investing in property can be a great way to achieve financial freedom or to put a little bit of extra money into your pocket. But when it comes to investing in property, there are a lot of different strategies you can use to achieve success. Now, not one particular strategy is the way to go. You can achieve success through all of these strategies. So today I wanted to highlight 10 of the common real estate investment strategies that you can consider when it comes to deciding how you want to invest in property. Hi, I'm Ryan from onproperty.com.au, your daily dose of property education and inspiration. Every single day, I release a new educational video, podcast, and article, as well as a new positive cash flow property for sale, which I have found for you and listed on the website. So you don't need to go trawling the internet on realestate.com.au for the next seven hours to try and find a property. Just head over to onproperty.com.au forward slash 138 to see today's property. And that is a property that is listed for $265,000 and it is on the Gold Coast where I live. So it's not in some regional center, which a lot of them are, but it's on the Gold Coast and it's currently estimated to rent for $430 per week. So that's an 8.44% rental yield. So that's pretty exciting. So again, you can find that at onproperty.com.au forward slash 138. Or if you're listening to this in the future or that property doesn't sound perfect for you, you can see our full list of properties by going to onproperty.com.au forward slash properties. So that's something that I'm doing in April, testing out. If a lot of people find this valuable and find this interesting, then I'll go ahead and keep doing it. So that's something that you like, go ahead, check it out. So 10 common real estate investment strategies. What are they? What are the benefits of each individual strategy? And what sort of person do you need to be to go about investing using these particular methods? So method number one is your buy and hold strategy. So this is a pretty common strategy. I would be I can't say specifically because I don't have the data on it, but I would say that this is the number one investment strategy used in Australia. And basically, all it is is purchasing a property in order to hold that property for the long term. You may be purchasing that property for rental income, or you may be purchasing that property for capital growth. It doesn't really matter. It's still going to be called buy and hold if you're buying it and holding it for a long period of time. So this is extremely common because as they say, property tends to double every seven to 10 years, so you can get great capital growth out of it. And also, rental incomes tend to go up over the years as well, which means over time, you keep getting more and more rental income from the property, and someone else can pay for your mortgage for you if it turns into a positive cash flow property. So buy and hold is extremely common, It's a pretty simple way to go as well because you don't have to know a great deal about how to renovate or how to do options or how to do all these funny things. It's just pretty basic. You buy property, you hold it, you sell it in the future or you keep it for the rental income. Method number two is renovation and that is purchasing a property in order to spruce it up put in some TLC, some tender loving care, and improve the value or the rental income of that property through renovation. Now, this can be as simple as doing a cosmetic renovation where you go in and you put in new carpet and you paint the walls and put a new front door in, simple stuff, or it can be as extreme as changing the layout by removing walls or moving walls and adding extensions to the property. So, Renovation is a common strategy used by a lot of investors and a lot of times it will be to purchase a property, renovate it and then flip it or on sell it as quickly as possible to make a chunky profit and then move on and do another renovation as well. So this can be a very profitable strategy but obviously it involves some good old elbow grease and getting in there and doing some work even if you're contracting out you still need to manage the project and so Technically, it's still work, so maybe I wouldn't classify it as elbow grease. All right, 
Method number two. Method number three is dual occupancy. Now, I sat down with Rochelle and Nicole, who are town planners here on the Gold Coast, which is where I live. Best place. I just moved here six months ago. It's awesome. I love it. But I sat down with them and we talked about dual occupancy and how to create a dual occupancy. You can check that out by going to onproperty.com.au forward slash 134 for episode 134 That's if that's something that you are interested in. Now, dual occupancy is creating two or more rental incomes from one property. So it's two or more dwellings from one title, I guess would be more specific. So that may be by adding a house or adding a granny flat onto the back of your property, or it could mean simply splitting your property. So downstairs is one self-contained living area and upstairs is a second self-contained living area, or the front is self-contained and the back is self-contained. You get the idea. Basically, you're getting multiple rental incomes on one title. And so that's dual occupancy and that can be a very profitable investment strategy in terms of rental income and can actually help when you come to sell your property as well because the one house can have multiple uses or generate an income for the people buying it. Method number four is subdivision. And so this is where you take a property or a plot of land and you draw a line down the middle and you turn it into two separate titles. So this means that one block of land can now be sold off or can now be developed on and the other block stands on its own as well. So they effectively, you're taking one title and you're turning it into two titles with smaller blocks of land. Subdivision is an expensive process to go through. I'll have to do an interview to find out the full cost for you and I'll go back to Rochelle and Nicole from pfpurbanplanning.com.au and they'll tell me how much it costs to do a subdivision. I think it's around the ballpark figure of about $30,000 or more to get a subdivision done. But obviously, if it's going to be profitable, then if you're spending $30,000 and you're going to make another $30,000 or more, it's probably worthwhile thinking about it. Method number five, common real estate investment strategies is development. And that's really taking subdivision to the next level. So rather than just subdividing, you might take a block of land and build townhouses or villas or units and then go ahead and strata title those. So basically, rather than just renovating a property or rather than just drawing that line in the sand to subdivide, you're going ahead and you're building multiple dwellings on you know what is one block of land or could be multiple if you subdivide it. But basically, you're going ahead and you're doing larger scale developments and that's extremely common among investors, especially as you tend to get on in your investment journey. Once you own two or three or more investment properties, it can be extremely lucrative to do these developments, but then often you need a larger cash outlay in order to get them going. So for newbie investors, they're kind of a bit out of reach. You can't really get to them, but for people who have done a few properties successfully in the past, it seems to be a natural progression into development for a lot of those investors. Number six is positive cash flow properties. And now this is, I guess, a spin on buy and hold because technically positive cash flow properties, you're still buying and holding them, but you're buying them specifically for the positive cash flow that they spin off. So this could be the positive cash flow from day one, or it could be the positive cash flow that allows you to pay off a mortgage so the property is purchased for you. But basically, positive cash flow property is property that generates more in rental income than you are paying in expenses. And that leaves some passive income left over that you can spend on whatever it is you want to spend it on. You could give it to your favorite charity or your church. You could use it to reinvest. You could use it to pay off the mortgage. You could use it to pay for your lifestyle. And a lot of investors will either go about investing using positive cash flow property to achieve financial freedom or they'll invest using method number seven, which we're about to talk about, negative gearing. And then in the future, when they've gotten that equity growth, they'll sell off some properties and turn their remaining properties into positive cash flow properties for that rental income. 
So positive cash flow properties are the probably the method that I love the most because I just love that idea of passive income coming in that you don't really have to work for and passive income that can actually grow over time as rents increase and as you pay off your mortgage. Method number seven is negative gearing. And so this is the opposite of positive gearing and is still in line with that buy and hold strategy we talked about in method number one. But with negative gearing, the rental income that you receive is less than the expenses that you're paying, which means you actually need to pay money every single month out of your wage or out of other income to keep that property going because otherwise you're going to default on your mortgage. The idea with negative gearing is that you lose money for a certain period of time, but the property goes up in value so that when it comes time to sell, you make much more money back. So be the equivalent of say you're paying $1,000 a month to this property and you do that for two years. That's $24,000. But if that property goes up by $100,000, then you've got $76,000 in equity there because you know, you've paid the 24, made 100, that makes 76. Obviously, you've got fees and stuff when you sell, but the goal is the property will grow faster than the money you're putting into it. Or potentially the goal could be that over time rents will increase and that negatively geared property will turn into a positive cash flow property. Method number eight is commercial real estate. So this is different to residential real estate in quite a few different ways. Firstly, when it comes to lending, you're likely to need a larger deposit for commercial real estate. With residential, the goal always seems to be a 20% deposit and this excuse me, allows you to avoid lender's mortgage insurance. But when it comes to commercial property, it tends to be around 30% deposit that you need. But the benefits with commercial property is, there's multiple different benefits, but probably the main benefits are that the leases are much longer on a lot of commercial properties. So rather than a tenant signing a six month lease, a tenant might sign a three year or a 10 year lease on that property. So you've got more security of income in some circumstances. And on commercial property as well, it's usually the tenant's responsibility to pay for all the outgoings. So you're talking about water, council rates, even things like repairs and maintenance become the responsibility of the tenant. So in commercial property, you may have the same yield as a residential property, but you may have less expenses because more expenses are covered by the tenant. So this can mean greater cash flow for you. Method number nine is house and land packages. So this is when you buy a block of land, but you've got approval already done to build a house on it and a builder contract in place to build that house. So you see the signs up everywhere, or well, at least you see them where I live in the Gold Coast, house and land from $425,000, house and land from $399,000. And basically what you're doing is you're buying a block of land that is going to be built on and deliver a house to you, but the house isn't there yet. So you're buying the house and land, but you have to wait for the house to be built. And method number 10 is simply purchasing land itself without any contract to build a house or build a property on it. And a lot of people do go ahead and invest in land. Obviously, land's very likely to be negatively geared because it's pretty hard to produce an income when you don't have a dwelling on your block of land. But you can get great capital growth with land and it is a smaller investment than investing in something that has a dwelling built on it because obviously it's just land. <laughs> you know, you're just going off land value and not how good the property is or how nice the kitchen they've put in is. So a lot of people do go ahead and invest in land as well. So there you have 10 common real estate investment strategies. Depending on you and depending on who you are, you may gravitate towards different investment strategies. An investor who just wants to do it as a sideline thing and doesn't want to have a great deal to do with their property might like to invest in the buy and hold strategy. But an investor who has more time and wants to do things quicker and get their hands dirty might benefit more from a renovation strategy or creating dual occupancies or doing development because then you can actually create your own equity through hard work. So there's a lot of different ways that you can invest. I hope that this has given you some food for thought 
as to the different methods of investment that there are. I love positive cash flow, as I said, it's my favorite. I have a whole course on how you can find positive cash flow properties and how you can research potential areas that you want to invest in. If something like that sounds interesting to you, then head over to positivecashflowacademy.com and sign up there. So I go through all these video training tutorials on how to find positive cash flow properties yourself and then how to find out things like past sales history, how long the property has been listed for, the demographics of the area and all this different stuff that's super useful if you're going to go ahead and invest. So again, that's positivecashflowacademy.com or if you just want to see the properties that I've listed, then again, go to onproperty.com.au forward slash properties and you'll see all of those listings over there. So until tomorrow, remember, your long-term success is only achieved one day at a time. You can actually mix it up as well. So you don't have to say, well, I'm going to invest in positive cash flow property and that's it. And I'm going to do it in a buy and hold method. You could actually say, I'm going to start by investing in a renovation project because I would love to build some equity faster. And then maybe if you build equity, you might want to spin it off into something like buy and hold that is less intensive. Or maybe you then want to scale that up and then do development to get even more equity and then profits from development go to buy and hold or go to negative gearing or go to commercial. It's not one is the best way to do it. It's about working out what your financial goals are and then creating a strategy to get you towards your financial goals. But I'm not a financial advisor, so I can't give you financial advice. But I can help you make sense of yourself and your own situation as much as possible. All right, now I am rambling. Shush, Ryan. Shush, shush, shush. All right, love you guys. (laughs) 